Here's what's coming up on your horizon. Well, it's often said necessity is the mother of invention. And this coming legislative session, lawmakers may have to get quite inventive to maintain state services while facing shrieking tax revenue. This week, our focus is on an area of government that continues to grow while other areas shrink, and that's our state prisons. Stay with us as we examine justice reform this week on Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. Oklahoma's investment in career tech provides more than nationally recognized technology education and training. It produces solid financial returns for the state's economic future. Oklahoma Career Tech, elevating our economy. And the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. And now, from the Career Tech Studios in Stillwater, here's your host, Rob McClendon. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us here on Horizon. Well, Oklahoma imprisons a larger percentage of its population than 47 of the 50 states. Now does that mean Oklahomans are just less law-abiding? Not at all. What we're seeing in the center state are the results of years of get tough on crime policies. That while certainly well-intentioned, has Oklahoma's prison system one of the three fastest growing in the country. Today, we begin with a look at how addiction recovery programs may be an answer to reducing our prison population. Austin Moore takes us to Ada, Oklahoma to visit a program called SOAR, which is short for Southern Oklahoma Addiction Recovery. The days are full for Glenn Mosley. We've been moving some yards today. Tomorrow we'll do the church. Next week, next Wednesday, I guess we'll pick up food for the needy, and Thursday we'll pass it out. Glenn is a resident of the Southern Oklahoma Addiction Recovery House in Ada, Oklahoma, where they firmly believe that idle hands are the devil's workshop. It's a, it actually feels good to be living sober again. So where is the therapeutic work program for um, nonviolent offenders, uh, court-ordered offenders, to integrate back into society. Doug Davis is the executive director of SOAR. He uses steady employment, nightly group meetings, and community service to keep these hands busy. That is a, a, a major part of it, to stay busy, to where you're not sitting around wondering and your mind's wandering. You, I mean, a lot of that went on while you was in your addiction on the streets and, you know, most generally wondering where you're going to get high at next or where you're going to go get your drink at next and how you're going to get the money to do it. Where we put them here, they don't have to worry about all that. They can focus on um, getting recovery and getting some sobriety days under them and knowing that they're going to go to work, that we have a job provided for them, we will transport them to them from the job, that they're going to have food to eat and they're going to have good meals to eat and there's going to be meetings in the evening time where they can talk and express their feelings to others that are in the same situation as them. I've been to prison a couple times and I'm, I just I don't want to go back. Resident Bill Murray is rediscovering himself in the sore kitchen. I've always been an early bird so uh, I started getting up at 4.30 of the morning going in and helping to cook and before, before I know it uh, I'm up at 4.30 every morning doing the cooking. So uh, I'm loving it man, I'm loving it. Uh, tonight is uh, chili dogs. It's putting structure back in my life. Uh, you know, getting up on a daily basis, doing, you know, what I need to do. Uh, I got a 12-step program and uh, and going to church regularly. And uh, that's good, positive, you know, surrounding myself by, with positive people. Yeah, we're all like brothers. I mean, it's a brother, brotherhood deal. Try to treat them like brothers and earn the respect of others and try to give respect. One thing these guys have in common is that they have a uh, addiction that they're fighting, whether it be alcohol, drugs, or pills, whatever it may be, and um, everybody can relate to that. That's in this program. So we have an open communication as far as things going on, and we see guys struggling. Uh, we've got guys in place in the house that are senior clients that have been or, you know, around the program, fixing to graduate the program that has done well, that will mentor and help the guys along the way that are struggling and trying to get it picked up. Of course, that support system is only one component of the program. SOAR is, after all, a therapeutic work program. 
if they're here, it's because they haven't been doing normal things in life, such as getting up and going to a job, um, providing for their family themselves, taking care of their utilities, whatever it may be. So that is what SOAR gives these men, a job and a pattern reflecting a normal, successful life. Dwayne Murray, president of the SOAR Board of Directors, says that pattern changes these participants. You do that over a six month period and you see uh, men's attitudes changing. Uh, and it's not so much about talking, it's about doing. I am physically doing something every day, going to a job. And so their self images start to, 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 to turn around. Stephen Ballard serves as CFO for LeechCo, an ADA-based manufacturer and major supporter of the SOAR program. They've had a rough go of it, made some bad decisions. They can come here, maybe be encouraged, uh, maybe learn some, some better habits and think, hey, there's, here's at least an environment if I stay here and work, you know, I can succeed. Ballard says this relationship is beneficial for both participants and his company as well. They have a reason to be here. They have a reason to succeed and do well. And you know, they're trying to get their life straight. They're trying to get back in, you know, society where they're working hard. They're earning money. They're, you know, putting their time. And uh, we've we've always had really good, uh, really a good relationship with the guys that run the house. And we've had good success with uh, the the quality of the workers. It's a great way for us to try out employees. And if they are here for the long haul, like a handful of these guys have been, wind up staying in ADA and like Leech Co. a lot, and we're able to provide them with a full-time steady employment. We run currently 25 guys here, and we could run 40 or 45 if, you know, if as far as employers go, because there's that big of a need for it. And we turn, you know, we have to turn the employers down a lot because we don't have the guys to, to work them. Um, the word is spread. <laughs> I am so proud of Ada, and it's unique to see this many people, the criminal justice system, counseling services, churches, employers, and just individuals all pulling together to work toward a common goal to solve a problem. I feel like I'm headed back to life now, back to the real life, instead of jails or institutions or maybe even death. Yeah. Did, did the program help you find something in yourself that, that maybe you hadn't seen in a while? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The real me instead of the monster. <clears throat> and that's been a struggle? Yes, sir. It was. But, I don't know. It seemed like it was a lot easier once I got here. I know that. Now, while the SOAR program has so far been focused on men, the group will open its first clean living house for women in 2016. Now, when we return, the state director of the Right on Crime Project joins us to look at justice reform from a conservative perspective. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon, featuring some of the good things that are happening in the great state of Oklahoma. Well, our guest this week is the Oklahoma State Director of Right on Crime, a group that believes justice reform is not only the right thing to do, but the fiscally conservative thing to do. Joining me now is Right on Crime's Adam Luck. So Adam, why do we incarcerate so many people here in the state? Yeah, well, well first I'll say it's not just Oklahoma, it's all across the United States, but um, Oklahoma is not unique in the fact that we just have uh, a lot of laws that specifically target nonviolent drug offenses. Um, and we, we punish those people uh, quite severely when compared to the rest of the United States. So I think when you look at the population in Oklahoma's prison system, a lot of them are nonviolent drug offenders, um, and, and that average is, is significantly higher than most other states in the United States. Now, we always hear about prison overcrowding. We hear about prison you know, understaffing for, for staff, too. Yep. Let's talk about this from a budget perspective. What has this meant for us? Well, it's meant that um, the corrections budget in Oklahoma is one of the uh, fastest growing and most significant budget items uh, in, in our budget. So in the last couple of years, it's one of the only one of the only you know handful of budget items that has actually increased where other state agencies have received you know a five percent cut. Um, 
our our corrections budget has grown significantly in the last uh, in the last ten years. Yeah, and that really doesn't even touch on the the social cost of incarceration. Oh, absolutely, especially when you consider you know Oklahoma has the highest female per capita incarceration rate in the United States, and you know the national average for uh, a child whose mother has been incarcerated they are now seven times more likely to be incarcerated themselves at some point in their life. So when you consider the, the impact on our communities and our families, um, the imperative to do something different just becomes even more uh, significant. Mm -hmm. Is it fair to say that when it comes to incarceration and when it comes to sentencing, really one size does not fit all? Absolutely. Um, you know, and I think that's what we've seen across the United States is that states have said we've got to do something different and that's going to look uh, different for our state um, because each state has different laws. And so I think for Oklahoma, even county by county, there's going to be different things that need to happen, um, you know, based on the judges and the prosecutors that are there, but also, you know, the problems that that particular county faces, uh, you know, for them. So, yeah, I think it will be different. It doesn't necessarily have to be one specific policy that's going to solve this issue statewide. Yeah. Do you differentiate between nonviolent and violent offenders? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think there's, you know, a lot of people will say it this way. There's a group of people that, um, that we are afraid of that need to be in prison. Um, you know, for whatever reason, the crimes that they've committed, uh, they belong there, that, that we're going to have to keep them in prison. Um, but there's another group of people that we might just be mad at. And I think the question now is, do they need to be in prison? Or are these people better served? Maybe, um, you know, we're looking at what is the root of their criminal behavior? Um, are we mad at them for using drugs? Are we mad at them for stealing something? And I think the question now has to be, is putting them in prison the best use of our resources? Um, and if not, what else can we do to better serve them? and really get the outcomes that we would expect from our correctional system. Mm -hmm. You know, from my own experience and having visited several prisons, drug abuse and drug problems is a, a unifying factor. Mm -hmm. Really, a, across the offenders, they may be in there for a different crime, you yeah. know, but there's some type of drug use back there. Oh, so what does that tell us, yeah. when we, the way we, we approach drugs here in the state? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think one thing it tells us is that a lot of times people will turn to crime to feed their addiction. Um, so when we look at somebody, we've got to look at and see, um, you know, like I said earlier, what are the what are the root causes of their criminal behavior? Um, and in Oklahoma, if if somebody's got a substance abuse addiction, you know, if they've got a, a substance abuse problem, um, what are the treatment options that we could provide for them that would potentially address those issues, hold them accountable for, um, you know, something like, for example, like drug court, where we can hold them accountable for going to this treatment and receiving this treatment. You know, and at the end of this you know, year-long program, they've actually addressed the reasons for their criminal behavior. Um, we've spent less money on them than sending them to prison, and now they're much less likely to recidivate and go back to prison after completing a program like that. So um, I think to answer your question, you know, we've got to look at uh, what are the alternative options that we could use instead of prison that are actually going to better address the root cause and save us money in the long run. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit more about recidivism. Does the real work start once someone is paroled? Well, I think the work starts, you know, um, day one, as soon as somebody is convicted. You know, um, the Department of Corrections, the job of corrections starts day one. Um, but, you know, I think your question is, you know, what, what is the work when somebody is released, mm -hmm. when somebody gets out of prison? Um, and I think, you know, in Oklahoma, not only do we, you know, incarcerate more people for more crimes for longer periods of time, but the effect of having a felony in Oklahoma is also much more significant. So. For example, you know, losing your driver's license or not being able to live in um, publicly subsidized housing or um, you know, having a difficult time finding a job. I mean, all those things are, are, are what we would call barriers to a successful reentry. Um, and when you look at you know, the effect of having a felony in Oklahoma, we never really, you know, people who are convicted of a felony in Oklahoma, it's very difficult for them to actually pay off their debt to society. Um, and the idea for, for most people, they would say, well, when somebody gets out of prison, They've paid their debts to society. They should be able to go back. They should have a second chance. And unfortunately, a lot of times in Oklahoma, that's just not the case. Um, so I think there is significant work that begins um, when somebody is released from prison. And a lot of that has to do with just being able to find a job, being able to support themselves, um, having the, the capacity to pay off the fines and fees that they owe, mm -hmm. um, being able to actually, you know, what, what we think of as reintegrating back into society. And that is significant work and, and oftentimes very difficult work in mm -hmm. Oklahoma. Are there any examples where some of these ideas that you're talking about that they've worked before? Oh, absolutely. Um, so the organization that I work for is called Right on Crime, and it's an initiative uh, based out of uh, an organization called the Texas Public Policy Foundation. It's the largest state-based think tank in the United States. It's based in Austin, Texas. Um, 
And this initiative started after 2007 when um, the Texas Public Policy Foundation really helped the Texas legislature figure out some different policy options that they could pursue in light of um, some predictions that they received for an increase in their prison system growth um, over the next five years from 2005 to 2010. So they essentially were faced with an option of, look, we either build new prisons to house an estimated you know, 18,000 more inmates uh, in the next five years, or we do something different. Um, so the Texas Public Policy Foundation helped them you know, come up with some different policy solutions, and essentially what they did was they invested a significant uh, amount of money. It was at the time about $241 million um, in one legislative session, and what they did was they developed, um, like I mentioned earlier, drug courts in every county in Texas. Um, they focused on reentry. They focused on helping people successfully reenter society, um, which significantly reduces their chances of recidivating. Um, and essentially since then, so since 2007, fast forward to 2015, um, mm -hmm. last year they had the lowest crime rate they've had since 1973. They've closed three state prisons. Um, they've closed eight juvenile facilities. They've cut their juvenile population by 52%. Um, they're estimating that they've avoided and saved about $3 billion uh, since then. So. Mm -hmm. What we've seen is you know, a conservative state, conservative legislature that's really pursued criminal justice reform in a smart, fiscally conservative way um, and really held the government accountable, held the corrections department accountable for the outcomes that we would expect given the amount of money that we're spending uh, in our correction system. So, and there's other examples too. I mean, Texas has kind of been one of the greatest examples of what this could look like. Um, and like I said earlier, you know, the point you touched on, which is that it's gonna look different for every state. Um, mm -hmm. And that's part of the work we're doing here is just trying to facilitate the conversation around what this will look like in Oklahoma um, and just trying to move this work forward here, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. I, I know it certainly sounds like budgetarily wise, it, this works. Mm -hmm. What about the emotional side? How do you go convince a lawmaker yeah. that you know we need to get people, some people maybe that are being incarcerated now out of prison yeah. and back on the street with that lawmaker knowing that there is the possibility some of them will reoffend? Right, yeah. Um, it certainly is a difficult argument to make um, given how you know, when, can, when you consider um, how many of us were raised, especially in Oklahoma, looking at it from a perspective of tough on crime. Um, you know, we have a significant portion of our legislature that would ascribe to the Christian faith, um, mm -hmm. as I myself do. And I think, you know, part of, part of the work that we're doing is, um, you know, from the faith perspective saying, you know, these are the things that, that you believe. Um, and, and how does that line up with the way that we treat someone who's wronged our society? You know, asking the question, are we truly giving them a second chance when they reenter society? Um, and I think that, that a lot of times communicates very well. Um, I think the, the point you mentioned earlier, you know, the impact on our society, the impact on our communities, um, I think is another very strong argument to make. Um, and then lastly, I think, you know, the, the gravity of our incarceration system in Oklahoma is such that one in 12, uh, this, the estimation is one in 12 Oklahomans um, have either been convicted of a felony or interacted with the prison system in some way, one in 12. So the chances are, whoever I'm talking to, they either know somebody or are one degree away from somebody who's interacted with the correction system in Oklahoma. Um, and that's just a lot of people. So I think when we, you know, it's easy to look at the, this issue and say, um, you know, these are just people who have done something wrong and they deserve it. Um, but when you really break it down, um, you know, these are our neighbors. These are people that, that we know, that we love, that we care about. These are our sons and daughters. Um, and I think when you break it down that way and you start to see that, you know, these people are coming back. You know, mm -hmm. we release close to 9,000 people from the Oklahoma prison system every year. Um, these people are coming back. And if we really care about our economy, if we really care about our families, if we really care about the direction and the trajectory of our state, um, what are we doing to make sure that we are going to prosper in the future? You know, what are we doing to make sure that these people have a chance, actually have a chance to reenter society and be successful after they've made a mistake and paid their debts to society? Um, so I think, you know, those are some of the things that we try and talk about. And, and I think the, the larger question is, you know, even if somebody in the legislature says, I agree with you 100% on these things, um, I think the larger question is, do they have the political capacity to support this? And I think that's what we're really seeing now is a shift in how politically this issue has been viewed in the past and how it's being viewed now, um, specifically because of the work that the governor's done in the Justice Reform Committee that they've started, um, the work that they're starting there. And, also, we've seen a lot of attention on this issue in Oklahoma County and Tulsa County because of the jails and the overcrowding in the jails. Um, so I think we're starting to see 
kind of the, the political language that's surrounded this issue for a long time is starting to shift, uh, and that's encouraging. Yeah, well, Adam, certainly an issue that could not be more important to our state. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming and visiting yeah. with us. Absolutely. Now, if you would like to see other perspectives on justice reform, Team we do have some of those streaming on our program. website, including some faith-based initiatives. Just head to our it's value added section love. at okrising.com. Up next on Oklahoma Horizon, a little bling with those boots. Well, Oklahoma's Diamond Hats proudly promote youth in agriculture, and it was my pleasure to serve as their master of ceremonies at this year's Diamond Hats Gala, a black tie event that raises money for our kids in boots. Joining me now is our Courtney May. The Diamond Hats organization promotes youth in Oklahoma who are pursuing agriculture endeavors. Since 2005, the organization has provided scholarships, mentoring programs, and contributions to students' livestock projects. And this year is no different as the Diamond Hats annual gala kicks off the fundraising year for 2016. It's a silent auction raising money for an auction that's making a lot of noise and an organization with an impact that's anything but silent. Since its debut in 2005, Diamond Hats have raised more than $2 million for Oklahoma's youth in agriculture. Tonight we'll raise quite a bit of money. All of that money will in turn go directly back to the youth in agriculture. We do scholarships, um, we purchase animals at OIE. This last year we bought some wheelchairs for some kids showing livestock. So whatever we can do to continue to help the youth in our state. The organization's primary focus of giving is the Oklahoma Youth Expo. All right, here we go, y'all. The world's largest junior livestock show. The money these women raise is helping young people experience agriculture firsthand. Our program now has come away to give kids hands-on, first-hand agricultural experience. They don't get that anywhere else now. There's not many kids that live on a farm. Buyers at the gala have a chance to purchase elk hunts, jewelry, gourmet dinners, and more. $70,000 is the number to beat from last year's auction, and Norvell says this year the expectations are higher. Hopefully we'll hit the $100,000 mark tonight, and all that money will go to support young people in the Sella Champions at the OIE, and then scholarships for our seniors that are graduating through OIE. 100% of the money raised is given to the youth in Oklahoma agriculture. And with new sponsors each year, Diamond Hats is securing the future of the Oklahoma Youth Expo and its scholarship recipients. We've gotten a lot of new sponsors this year, um, just trying to reach out to let other people know what we have and how important it is to give back to the community, but also to get the kids continually back involved in agriculture and stay right here. At this year's annual gala, the Diamond Hats had a 60% increase in money raised from the previous year, raising more than $121,000 for Oklahoma's youth in agriculture. Now, I know all this money does go back to the youth in agriculture. What type of scholarships are we actually talking about? Well, each year, nearly 50 graduating seniors receive the Oklahoma Youth Expo Academic Scholarship, and the Diamond Hats play a large role in funding this scholarship, which is estimated an average $130,000 per year. And not only that, but they also purchase animals at the sale of champions, and then they also provide scholarships for the champion breeding and reserve champion breeding animals at the Oklahoma Youth Expo. All right, thank you so much, Courtney. You're welcome, Rob. Well, at this year's event, the Diamond Hats presented their Woman of the Year Award to Sky McNeil. McNeil is a former state lawmaker that spearheaded legislation important to the agricultural community and says groups like the Diamond Hats are critical to the success of one of Oklahoma's largest industries. This program is huge for our um, youth of Oklahoma who are um, in the livestock industry. Those are the folks that are going to feed our nation. And this group of men and women really encourage those kids, they support those kids, and there's nothing more important that we can, that we can do than supporting our youth. McNeil currently serves as the Executive Director of the Oklahoma Association of Career and Technology Education. Want to share something you've seen here today? Well, all of our episodes are streaming on our YouTube channel at Oklahoma Horizon TV. Or you can subscribe to our weekly free podcast on iTunes. Then the ball will come through here. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, 
we look at arts education and look at the role creativity plays in our overall economy. We're trying to figure out ways that we can weave it in meaningfully. Because realistically, we know we don't have kids who are gonna be future artists. I mean, maybe a handful, but, but you're trying to figure out a way where this can be a lifelong thread um, in someone's life. Arts and Education on Oklahoma Show for the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, that is gonna wrap us up for today, but you can see more of any of our stories on our website at okhorizon.com. You can follow us throughout the week at Twitter at OK Horizon TV, or you can just become a Horizon fan on Facebook. I'm Rob McClendon. Thanks for including us in your day. Hope to see you back here next week. Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. Thank you for watching Oklahoma Horizon.